Today we are going to be continuing with our study in Daniel chapter 11. For certainty, we're going to have two more, two more messages besides today's message. So welcome again. Please join me in a word of prayer as we petition the Lord to be present here with us as we worship His name and study His word. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we come before you and we want to thank you for the Sabbath that you have given us. We thank you for being our God, for taking care of us, for bringing us together yet once more, giving us an opportunity to study your word, to understand the things that you have left for us in these last days. We are continuing with prophecy. And Father, I pray and ask that as we examine the verses today and the historic narrative that matches those verses, I pray and ask that you give us wisdom to understand them, that you help us to see the bigger picture, to understand why all these things are presented in that chapter and how it leads to certain events that are going to be transpiring here at the end of time so that we can ultimately use it to our benefit, use it as an evangelistic tool and reach others with the message, with the three angels' messages. I thank you, Father. I want to pray specifically for myself. I pray and ask that you guide my mind, that everything is articulated in the best way possible, that you give me thoughts that are needed to make things clear I pray for every person present here with us. I ask that you send an angel to protect every single one of us so that we are focused on your word. We thank you, Lord, once more, and we pray and ask this in the precious name of your dear Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. The title for today is France and the King of the North. Now, just a very quick recap. We've been moving through the chapter. We got... To verse 35 last time we were together and in verse 35 we wrapped up with some of the events that were taking place during the Protestant Reformation we know that these verses there brought us to the period of the Protestant Reformation we know that the time of the end was mentioned we already know that the period of the time of the end points us to the year 1798. We talked about this transition that takes place between pagan Rome and papal Rome. That's why the understanding of the daily is extremely important. And this is why I believe the understanding of the daily has been in one way or another um, misunderstood by modern day Adventists. Let's leave it at misunderstood. We are not here to claim authority over the word of God, but most certainly... I believe in what I am sharing with you. I believe that it clearly depicts the narrative of Daniel chapter 11 based on the historic information and the specifics of the verses. So we already know that we dealt with this transition between pagan and papal Rome. We already talked last time we were together as to what was going to happen during the 1260 year period. We talked about people falling away, people being persecuted, we talked about for, uh, the Reformation being there. We talked about the earth opening its mouth to help the people. We even mentioned Revelation 12 and the fact that the United States of America was established because of Bible prophecy, because of the things that were taking place in Europe primarily and the persecutions of the Roman Catholic Church. So those of you here, Americans, never forget why your nation has been established. It deals with Bible prophecy. Prophecy. This is why the Bible refers to the United States as, as, a, as a nation that was based upon the horns of a lamb. These two horns of a lamb mentioned in, in Revelation 13. It was established on good principles. This is why we have the amendments that, or the amendment that deals specifically with the division of church and state. Because once church and state are united, history... And Bible prophecy tells us that things are not, going to, are not going to go well for anybody. And that brings us to verse 36. Now I'm going to share personal conviction. For some reason, verse 36 to verse 39 is, again, heavily debated. But in my personal study, as I was meditating and examining the history and the narrative of verse 36, through to verse 39, because 36, 37, 38, and 39, they are really describing one and the same event. Those four verses are talking about one and the same event. To me, that was the part of the chapter that was straightforward. I don't know if I had some sort of a bias 
to that or not, but I can testify for myself that I did not see why it could be so heavily debated, though, as we shall see now, it's not unreasonable to perhaps conclude a different thing from what the Bible presents there because there are certain similarities as we shall see now. The language used there in those four verses is similar to when the Bible uses verses with respect to somebody else, with respect to another power, not only in the book of Daniel, but in the New Testament as well. But when we closely examine things, we're going to see that although they are very similar, there are indeed some differences as well. So without further ado, let us open our Bibles. What I will do is I will just read verses 36 through to 39 in Daniel chapter 11. And even though, like I said, they are depicting one and the same event, we are going to maybe break them into two separate sections so that we can follow along with the different language used in all of these four verses and link that to history. We're again going to resort to a lot of history. Starting at verse 36 in Daniel 11, the Bible says, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. These four verses depict a particular power in history. Now, before we jump into history, let's bring out the similarities that I had just mentioned, and then also come back to the chapter and examine certain things that we mentioned in the past with respect to this chapter and the, the, the usage of different phrases in the chapter. Now, when we hear these verses, especially verse 36 in particular, is there another section in the Bible that verse 36, for example, sounds a little bit familiar to? And the answer is yes. The language that is used here in the beginning of this section describing this power does indeed sound similar. That is clear. If we go to the Bible to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, you will see a slightly, a very similar language being used in that verse. It says, Who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. How many of us here know what this verse is applicable to, or who this verse is applicable to? I think all of our hands will be going up right about now, right? This is in reference to the papal power. It is in reference to the Pope himself. Now, did you see certain similarities between what we see here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and what we read in verse 36 and onward? Absolutely, there are similarities. Now, are these verses, however, identical? And I think that is also another clear answer. No, they are not identical. We received a lot more characteristics in these four verses that we read, aside from the characteristics that we see here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. So now let's look at the two passages besides each other. So on the left column, you have 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and then on the right column, you have the characteristics that are found in... Daniel chapter 11, verses 36 through to 39. So here are the similarities. Right off the bat, we see that both powers exalt themselves above God. But then there's a slight difference with respect to the rest of the characteristics. The power on the left, mentioned in 2 Thessalonians, sitteth in the temple of God. 
And when we look at the section in the book of Daniel in chapter 11, we see that not only is there a lot more given with respect to the power mentioned in 36 to 39, but it also, it also brings out a few things that are not found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. For example, it says that it will not regard any God. So first and foremost, why is there similarities? And secondly, why are there differences? I will give out the answer and then we're going to go through history and demonstrate how history testifies to the answer that has been given. I think we've all witnessed that in this world, there's always a push between the right and the left. Can we agree on that? Now, who, this, who does this world belong to? The enemy, right? It, it is still not God's world. He is the one who inspires people in this world. And in fact, he is the one who is behind the push that comes from the right and the push that comes from the left. The right and the left are simply, when compared to the ways of God, just another side of the same coin. Now, while it is true that a certain principle could be found within the right that are applicable to what I stand for and as, an, as an individual, ultimately we know that even the right itself is not perfect because it does not reflect all of God's principles found in the Word of God. Now, thinking about what I just said, let's connect this with two principles that stand behind the right and the left. If I were to ask you, what are the two ideologies that stand behind the right and the left? What would you say? What is the ideology that stands behind the, those that consider themselves on the right, those that consider themselves conservatives? And what are most of the ideologies, not always, but what is that primary ideology behind many of the people who would consider themselves that they are on the left spectrum of things? Christianity and secularism or atheism. Now, those that are on the right and claim Christianity, are they reflecting the truth that God has given for us in these last days? Not really, right? The Bible tells us that we have a main player within the United States of America, and the Bible refers to that player, the conservative spectrum of things, is what? What is the phrase that the Bible uses? The false prophet. Why does it call it a, the false prophet? Because first and foremost, it is a prophet. It presents itself as a representative of Christ, but it's a false prophet because it does not do what? It doesn't give the truths of God. And that ultimately originates with this very power that we find here in 2 Thessalonians that the Bible speaks about, the men of sin. What is the title given to this power, the man of sin? He is the Antichrist. But here's, here's the difference between the man of sin and between another power that does not necessarily ascribe to Christianity. To be antichrist, to be against Christ, according to the Bible, when we study about Babylon, when we study about the little horn, to be against Christ is not in the most literal sense presented through Catholicism. Naturally speaking, if you are against Christ, you must be an atheist. All atheists are against Christ, are they not? They do not recognize religion, they do not recognize Christianity, Christ and God as those who are to be leading our lives. But is that what the papacy does? Is that how the papacy presents itself in this world? Absolutely not. At a first glance, the Antichrist power presents itself as a representative of Christ. And this is why the word Antichrist means in the place of Christ. But even though it presents itself as the representative of God, as one who acknowledges the sovereign of the universe, it still does all the things that we see here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it opposes God. It sitteth as God in the temple of God and show himself that he is God. That is the work of the Antichrist power. 
at a first glance on the outside, even though that power presents itself as a Christian power, it is indeed not a Christian power. But it doesn't do that openly, so to speak. Now, on the other hand, atheism does it openly. Have you met an atheist who sits in the temple of God and presents himself to be God and to honor God and to pretend that they are a religious institution doing work for God? Have you heard of an atheist that call himself the vicar of Christ? No, right? But ultimately, atheism does the exact same thing as does the papacy. It is just the other side of the same coin. And this is why we see similarities in the language here being used between 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and some of the language used here in Revelation chapter 11 verses 36 all the way onward. It is not because they're necessarily the one and the same exact entity or power, but because their work is the same. In both instances, they work against God. They just do it from a different angle, so to speak. So now that we've mentioned that, let's jump back to the Bible. Let's jump to Daniel 11 and, and remember some of the principles that we already examined so that we see that what I just mentioned here, and as we go through history, so that what I just mentioned is indeed in line with what the Bible wants to present to us. So what was my concluding argument? Although there are similarities between what the papacy does and the language used here in Daniel chapter 11, 36 to 39, we don't have a representation of the papacy in these verses, but rather we have a representation of atheism taking place within a kingdom. But here's how we can confirm that without even jumping into history. When we looked at the beginning, and when we examined the first verses, we noticed that the Bible continually used different phrases for the different players being presented. We began with the Middle Persian Empire, and then when Alexander the Great came, the Bible referred to him as a mighty king. After Alexander came, we know that the Grecian Empire fell apart, and that four major horns stood out. As a result of that, four main areas were created. And then ultimately we learn that the battles that took place in the opening verses of Daniel 11 were connected with the Seleucid Empire that took control of a lot of the area that was north of Israel. And particularly it took control of part of the area that belonged to the northern division of Alexander's kingdom, which was ruled under Lysimachus originally. It took possession of portions of that land, and as a result, it could rightfully be called by the Bible as the king of the north. But we know that the king of the north was the Seleucid Empire. We then learned that the Ptolemaic Empire was referred to as the king of the south, and we studied up until verse 15 these battles that took place between these two entities. And then the Bible showed us that the phrase, the king in the north, disappears. And it does not come back until verse 40. Logically speaking, it is because the king of the north was no longer going to be a player in the verses that were to follow. And then we recognize that the verses to follow were connected with the children of the robbers. And that was Rome. Further on, we learn that as we continue reading these verses, the Bible does not refer to Rome as the king of the north, does it? Does it even use the phrase the king of the north once through the following verses all the way up until where we've gotten so far? No. The Bible constantly uses the he and the him, the he and the him. Not even once does the Bible refer to that player as the king of the north. Why? Because, well, obviously and logically speaking, it isn't the king of the north. It is just another player. The Bible does not refer to him even as the king. The phrase the king is not used from verses 
15 all the way to verses 36. And now all of a sudden, when we come to verses 36, as we are getting closer to the year 1798, the Bible opens with the phrase, and the king shall do according to his will. Within Adventist circles, the claim is made that the king here spoken of is the same player that has been the focus of the prophecy up until this point. So here is my question. Why is it that this phrase comes up for the very first time now when this player has been the focus all the way back to verse 15? Remember when the Bible used the phrase, the king of the north, it constantly repeated it in the opening verses. When it used the phrase, the king of the south, yes, it, it used the he and the him as well. But every second verse or so, the Bible would reiterate this idea. We're talking about the king of the north. We're talking about the king of the south. Don't get this wrong. The he and the him are in connection to the king of the north and the king of the south. But then as the children of the robbers come, the Bible just continues to talk about he and him, he and him, he and him. It does not even once use the phrase the king. The phrase the king is used for the very first time in verse 36. So who is that king? And if it's the same king, why is it the first time that the Bible uses that phrase? When we've seen already enough to present to us that if this player is the same as the player we've been talking about in the previous verses, that phrase, the king, should have already been mingled into the previous verses, just like the phrase, the king of the north and the king of the south, was mingled within the verses that we read when we studied the battles that took place between the Seleucid and the Ptolemaic Empire. Not only that, but the Bible adds even a little bit more here to make us certain that we are not speaking about the same power, but we're speaking about a king or the king that was going to do the very next things that are described in the verses to follow. The phrase claiming that the king shall do according to his will is used three times in the book of Daniel chapter 11. Three instances. We go back into the beginning, and we already mentioned Alexander. He's described as a mighty king. The Bible says, A mighty king shall stand up, that shall rule with great dominion. And then the Bible adds that phrase, and do according to his will. Was Alexander a new king in relations to the preceding verses? Or was he connected to the same power in the preceding verses when we go to the beginning of the chapter? He was a new king because the preceding verses were speaking about the Middle Persian Empire. And when a new king showed up, the mighty king or mighty king as it is referred to, speaking about Alexander, who was going to do according to his will, we see that a new king was introduced who was connected to a new power. That's the first instance this phrase was used, do according to his will will. The second time it is used was in verse 16. Now in verse 16, we had just transitioned from what? Remember when in verse 15, we finished, we wrapped up with the conflicts that took place, the Ptolemic Empire and the Seleucid Empire, the king of the north and the king of the south. We had now a new king introduced, which in that particular instance, he was specifically talking about about Rome and Julius Caesar ruling and doing certain things. The verse there said, But he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land which by his hand shall be consumed. So the second time the phrase that was used, do according to his will, in Daniel chapter 11, followed the same sequence. It brought out a new king. We were no longer talking about the king of the north. It was a new player coming on the scenes who was going to do according to his will. So when we put all that together, we see that logically speaking, without even checking history, 
just looking at the narrative of the Bible and the phrases that are used in the Bible, we ought to know that the king is not the power that has already been talked about, but rather a new power that was also going to do to his own will based on the narrative in the following verses. It gave us a lot of characteristics of what this king was going to do. We looked at them when we compared those characteristics with 2 Thessalonians. So just based on the narrative of the chapter, if we were reading that chapter for the first time, if we were meditating upon the phraseologies, without even having gone into history, we should be able to pick up these new players entering the narrative just by meditation upon the chapter. Now we are going to jump into history and allow history to testify to us that this king that was spoken of in verse 36, given all these characteristics, is indeed a fulfillment of atheistic France. The time frame connects with it. The language of the Bible, specifically the phraseologies, connect to it. And now we're going to see that our third witness, history, is going to testify to the proper interpretation of these verses. We have atheistic France. As we come near to the end of this 1260-year period, within France, a work began that was against God and against Christ. It wasn't as visibly against God. It, sorry, let me rephrase that. It was visibly against God and against Christ, unlike the papacy, which does it by confusion. Babylon, right? That's what Babylon, Babylon is, confusion. The papacy's goal is to confuse us that it is a Christian power, but it isn't. And this is why we had these similarities between the papacy and between atheistic friends described here. Because both powers do one and the same thing, they just do it from a different perspective or point of view. One does it openly, and one presents itself to be a vicar, a representative of Christ. Same coin, different sides. So let's look at verses 36 and 37 first. We know that the Bible told us that this player, this king, is going to magnify and exalt himself above every god and speak marvelous things against the God of gods. So let's open to the pages of history now and see how exactly this very thing took place just shortly prior to the year 1798. I want to share a quote from Baron de Holbach. Now, this Baron did not live to go through the entire French Revolution that began in 1789. But his ideology, his ideas, were what was found within that nation. He had many followers, many people who adopted the same kind of ideology. And what he says here very clearly defines what took place within the French Revolution starting in the year 1789. He says, to discover the true principles of morality, men have no need of theology, of revelation, or of gods. They have need only of common sense. He was a French encyclopedist and philosopher, a celebrated exponent of atheism and materialism, whose inherited wealth allowed him to entertain many of the noted philosophers of the day. He had many disciples, so to speak, many people who embraced this ideology, the ideology of atheism. In New World Encyclopedia, we read the French Enlightenment also popularized atheism and anti-clericalism. It influenced the French Revolution's direct assault on the privileges of the Catholic Church. False dichotomies. Satan's really good at that. He's really good at presenting two options to the people, both equally wrong. He's a master of that. On one hand, you had the suppression of the Catholic Church taking place during the 1260-year period. Was that God's 
ideology? Of course not. And now with atheism, you have another group of people who come to oppose that. Who come to fight against that. But yet, they're just equally as wrong as doing the same thing as the system that already had been um, presenting itself to be magnifying itself also against God. He's the master of false dichotomies. He puts people against each other and pushes them further and further away from the truth. And he doesn't care which camp we end up in as long as we settle for one of his two false theories. And we've witnessed him do that even today with respect to many subjects, even with respect to Adventist subjects. Pastors use false dichotomies. I have listened to pastors who misrepresent your position in front of the people, and they leave people with two false choices to choose from. We have atheism being popularized within the French Revolution. The dechristianization of France during the French Revolution describes the result of a number of separate policies conducted by successive governments of France between the start of the French Revolution, so this is what we are focused on, 1789, and the Concordat of 1801, forming the basis of the later and less radical secularistic policies. Secularism, atheism, that is what was taking place in France. The aim of the campaign between 1790 and 1794 ranged from the appropriation by the government of the great landed estates. We'll come back to that point just in a second in one of our later verses because it's, it's part of the narrative here. And the large amounts of money held by the Catholic Church to the termination of Christian religious practice and of the religion itself. During the course of the revolution, the church was nationalized with priests required to break their allegiance to Rome. Thousands of priests who refused were defrocked and exiled. Churches were ransacked and plundered, and hundreds of priests were executed. The church's role in France was permanently altered. Atheism magnified itself above every god. Atheism spoke marvelously against the god of gods. Atheism also did not regard the God of their fathers. Who was France? Why, why France? Why is France so particular? How is France connected with the Roman Catholic Church and with Bible prophecy? Where do we see this connection? Well, France was one of the horns that came about of the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Revelation 17 talks about the woman riding the beast. And that beast also had ten horns. Right? We remember that? Those horns are the very horns spoken of here in Daniel as well. We have the woman through the 1260-year period riding the beast. What did it do? Well, it used the power of the state, receiving it from those horns to persecute God's people and to do its biddings. And this is what France did. Until it hated the woman. But coming back to the thought here, atheism, France, did not honor the God of its fathers. Because it is opposed itself above everything that is called God. Another marker that we found in the verses was that neither shall he regard the desire of women. How was that fulfilled, prophetically speaking? The word woman used in those verses is also and primarily the word wife. You, you already know, but I live in the French portion of Canada. Quebec. 
there, the French portion of Canada, because it was the French that got here on this part of this continent and took hold of this land before the Brits. Now, here in Quebec, my wife is not allowed to carry my last name by law. She cannot have her husband's last name. If, if a government authority calls in, they will only speak to her in connection to her maiden name. She cannot inherit my name. French practice. Where does it come from? On September 20th, 1792, the Legislative Assembly, in its last session before dissolving, passed a decree that made divorce a civil rather than a religious process. Going back to the Garden of Eden, what were the two institutions that God set in place in the Garden of Eden? The Sabbath and marriage. Who attacks these two institutions? <laughs> Satan, right? How does he do it? Same coin, two different sides. Same coin, two different sides. You see the idea coming forth here? While the papal power attacks the law of God and the Sabbath in particular, atheism and secularism have a direct attack on the marriage institution. Secularists don't even bother to get married anymore. Now we're not even going to say what, when, when you break the family union, when you legalize divorce, when you present it as just, you know, we're just, it's just a civil contract. When you take away what God instituted in the Garden of Eden, the concept of one flesh, what do you think the result of that would be? Licentiousness, all these things that take place in the world. Introduced during the French Revolution on the 20th of September, 1790. So we've looked at some of the markings. We'll, we'll continue reading from history. We know that as we carry on, this king, now being having a push towards a secularistic republic, was also going to honor the God of forces within this narrative. So, so like I said, these four verses just describe this event. They're specifically talking about the, the things that took place within the French Revolution, especially the opening year, 1789 to 94, etc. Honor the God of forces, strange God, and he shall also divide the land for gain. A lot of specifics that were not found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So let's read more from history. Let's see what else happened in that period and how that period is connected to what we see here in verses 38 and 39 in particular as well. An especially notable event that took place during Francis' process of dechristianization was the Festival of Reason, which was held on November 10, 1793 in Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. On the main nave was placed an imp improvised mountain on which stood a Greek temple dedicated to philosophy and decorated with busts of philosophers. At the basis of the mountain was located a torch of truth. Some loose living girls took occasion to celebrate at the main altar the cult to the goddess reason with Phrygian bonnets on their heads. The Bible said that this king will honor no god. In its place, the goddess of reason is presented. The ideology found within the French Revolution was against deity and the existence of such a deity. 
On the 23rd of November, 1793, churches were closed to be converted into warehouses, manufacturing works, or even stables. Streets and other public places bearing the names of saints were given new, often Republican-themed names, and time itself was recast to further repudiate Francis Christian past. We're not going to honor the God of our forefathers. We're going to do whatever we can to prevent that, to change France. But the Bible also said that they will honor the God of forces. A picture says a thousand words. The anarchists were the revolutionists scattered all over France. They had given themselves to the revolution body and soul. They in understood the necessity for it. They loved it and they worked for it. Many of them gathered around the Paris Commune because it was still revolutionary. Their effective means of action was the opinion of the people, not the public opinion of the middle classes. Their real weapon, the Bible said that they are going to honor the God of forces. And what weapon was used during the French Revolution? Their real weapon was the insurrection and with this weapon, they influence the deputies and the executive power. Anarchy. Insurrection. Within the, pro uh, within the French Revolution, we see how the revolution itself led to that ideology being adopted by many individuals. Force. Is that how God works? No. When it became necessary to make a fresh attempt to inflame the people and to march with them against the Tuileries, it was they who prepared the attack and fought in the ranks. And when the revolutionary enthusiasm of the people had cooled, they returned to the obscurity from whence they had sprung, leaving us only the rancorous pamphlets of their adversaries by which we are enabled to discover the immense revolutionary work they have accomplished. As to their ideas, they were clear and decided. The Republic, of course, they believed in it. This is why the Bible talks about the God of forces being honored within that window, within those verses. This is what we see taking place within French Revolution. The word revolution in and of itself usually is connected to this kind of stuff, unfortunately. How often have we witnessed peaceful revolutions in the world? Not that very often. The God of forces is usually part of every revolution that takes place on this earth. Aside from the God of forces, we also learned that the land will be divided for gain, something precisely fulfilled in those times. So let's turn to the pages of history here once more. The National Constituent Assembly completed the abolition of feudalism, suppressed the old orders, established civil equality among men, at least in metropolitan France, since slavery was retained in the colonies, and made more than half the adult male population eligible to vote, although only a small minority met the requirement for becoming a deputy. The decision to nationalize the lands of the Roman Catholic Church in France to pay off the public debt led to a widespread redistribution of property. How did the French, uh, the, 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 newly, the push for the newly establishment of the French Republic divide the land for its own gain? Well, it began by seizing properties that belonged to the Roman Catholic Church in France. Did it stop there? Of course not. Aside from collecting all the lands that belonged once to the church, many individuals at that time were living outside of France, the émigré. And who were they? Any of the Frenchmen, quoting from Encyclopedia Britannica, at first mostly aristocrats, so some French aristocrats, who fled France in the years following the French Revolution of 1789, 
What happened to them? <laughs> what happened to the land that they owned? From their places of exile in other countries, many of them plotted against the revolutionary government seeking foreign help in their goal of restoring the old regime. The revolutionary leaders in France, fearful of their activity, took action against them. So all these aristocrats who had fled, who did not return by January 1792, what was going to happen to them, were liable to death as traitors in the same year their property was confiscated by the state. Not only was the land of, that belonged to the Roman Catholic system divided up for gain, so was the land of those aristocrats who had left and wanted to fight against the French Revolution. An exact a direct, and direct fulfillment of the verses, something that, in fact, we do not see clearly being fulfilled by the other power that we studied up until verse 35, the papacy. We see all the various characteristics that were listed with respect to the power here in those verses, the characteristics found in the right column on the screen, being fulfilled through the period of the French Revolution. When did the French Revolution begin? 1789. Within the next few years, all these verses were fulfilled. We don't even have to wait all the way until the end of that revolution because we know that the revolution extended for over a decade almost. But within the few years, we see a fulfillment of that. We see atheism being presented in France. And then the natural question would be why? Why is France being introduced in these verses? What's the purpose of that? There's always a reason behind everything in the Bible. Now we know that this is referenced also in Revelation chapter 11. All the powers, the main players here, are also found where? In the book of Revelation. Was France connected to Rome in one way or another? Oh yes, absolutely. It was one of the horns. The French are one of the horns that belongs to the beast with seven heads and ten horns in the book of Revelation. The French were the ones that the woman was riding for that period of time. Until near the end, something different takes place. The Bible describes that as well. But what further need of France being mentioned here? Well, the answer is in the following verse. We're going to read the following verse. We're going to address something briefly without getting into the history because we are out of time today. But please join us next time because in the, in the following verses, we're going to see some conflicts beginning again between powers that we had not talked about for quite some time since verse 15. So in verses 36 to 39, we have France being introduced and specifically atheistic France. And now when we move forward into the word of God, down to verse 40, we read the following. When was the French Revolution? When did it start? 1789. Now look at the sequence of events here. And at the time of the end, so the thought is continuing. We've got 1789, even 1790, 91, 92, all the things that we talked about happened within the first two to three years of the revolution. And as we continue forward, as we get now to the time of the end, what is the time of the end? We already know that. 1798. The Bible says, And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. Who is the him? Well, the king that we were just speaking about. The king that was introduced in verse 36. So in the year 1798, the king of the south Here's that phrase coming back again, shall push at him. 
and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. So France going, is going to be involved in a conflict with the king of the north and the king of the south in the year 1798, according to the Bible. And the question is, was that so? Do we have a conflict between the king of the north, the king of the south, and the already established atheistic France in 1798? And the answer is, we do. But we will find out more about that the next time we are together. We've established an important point again, an important way mark, if you will, in the prophecy. So in closing, I just want to summarize the concept that the Bible presents here and why it is so important for us to understand it. If we had studied Rome between verses 15 to 35, if we had already talked about the transition between pagan Rome and papal Rome, if we had already talked about the 1260-year period when the papacy was persecuting God's people, because that's what we saw in the opening verses within Daniel 11.30, if we've already talked about the Reformation, even if, if we've already talked about that the things that are transpiring are going to continue to the time of the end, because this is what we read in verse 35, the phrase, the time of the end, was already mentioned, but it was mentioned with respect to Rome, because, or rather with respect to the papacy, because the papacy was going to do these things already mentioned up until the year 1798. It would be redundant for the Bible to be repeating that in verses 36 to 39. Point number two, the language of the Bible clearly tells us that we have a different player from the one that was being talked about in the previous verses prior to 36. Every single time the Bible connected, he shall do according to his will, was with respect to a new player coming on the scenes who was going to do something himself. First he was Alexander the Great, then he was Rome, and now we've got France. The phrase, the king, was not used between verses 15 or 16 to 35. For the very first time, the phrase the king is used in verse 36 to tell us, to signify to us that we're talking about a different king. It's not the king of the north. He's not the king of the south. He's not the mighty king that was spoken of with respect to Alexander the Great. It is just another king. And that king did the various things listed between verses 36 to 39, and the fulfillment of that is France. And now France, according to the Bible, at the year 1798 going forward, we're going to finish. Uh, we'll, we'll go all the way to verse 44 next time. We're going to look at the history. We're going to see how France, the king of the north and the king of the south, and we'll talk more about them next time, are going to have a conflict taking place. So in closing, I want us to bring back Christ again into our minds because we've looked at history, we've looked at certain things that have taken place, and I want us to leave with the most important thing. We see a very great example in the, in the Word of God as to how Satan is everywhere. He's on the left and he's on the right. He's among those who profess to be openly against Christ, but he's also with those who profess to be with Christ but are actually doing the exact same thing, denying Christ. Brothers and sisters, let us not fool out ourselves that it's good enough for us to call ourselves Christians or Seventh-day Adventists. What Jesus wants of us is not to be united with just another side of all these false coins that the enemy has, he doesn't want us to be in the place of Christ. This is what the papacy does. He doesn't want us to oppose Christ openly as atheism does. He wants Christ to be in us. 
Not we in the place of Him, but Him in the place of us. That is the message. And we see that all throughout the Bible. So may we as individuals make the solemn decision day in and day out because we might make that decision today. But only today is given. That same decision needs to be made tomorrow and the day after. But let's stick with today. How many of us here today want to have Christ in the place of I today? Amen. So now we'll have our closing hymn and return for our closing word of prayer. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, Lord God Almighty, Father, I pray and ask that as we acquire historic knowledge, as we acquire understanding of your prophecies, I pray and ask that we can also acquire just as much of your spirit. Because the knowledge and understanding needs to be mingled with the spirit of Christ so that love can reign supreme in us as individuals and ultimately, it is that love towards you and love towards other human beings that will bring out the end. Father, I pray and ask for every person that is here today. I begin with myself. I ask that you cleanse me of all iniquity, that you help me to be a better person today and a better person tomorrow. I pray and ask that you help us as individuals to strive to walk after you to strive to surrender to you because that is the most important part of our day. I pray that you remind us of the things, the kings that we need to iron out, the things that need to be taken care of in us so that we can be prepared to see you face to face one day. We're looking forward to that day and we are thanking you today for the time you have given us to accomplish that. I pray that you have us wisdom and understanding to be able to use this chapter to our advantage so we can help others to come to a knowledge of the three angels' messages. I pray that as we study these things, it is natural for us to need more information, to need more clarification. I pray that you will create a desire in each of our hearts to do that for ourselves because ultimately we are only responsible to you for everything we know and everything we do. I thank you, Father, once more, and I pray and ask this in the precious name of your dear Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.